Right now, our panel here is going to be talking about the hemp plant, uh, primarily known as the industrial hemp plant, which became legal in 2018. And so now hemp is considered to be a, any, a plant like a potato or a strawberry. So we're no longer a Schedule One narcotic, which is great. So uh, it has many uses. And uh, here on our panel, it's pretty much an international panel here. We have Jorgen Hempel, of all the last names in the world to be in hemp, it's Hempel. And uh, he is out of Switzerland. And in the middle, you have John Rulak, a California boy, born and raised. And he has two companies here in California, started Nutiva. And now he does Reed Botanicals, which is a CBD e extract. Uh, for topicals. And the third is Alika, and he is Hawaiian. So I'm going to start, and he, all three hemp advocates, and so I'm going to start with Alika and uh, his story about life in, of hemp in Hawaii and the political will that it takes to get the seed in the ground and grown in a way that's going to be healthy for the planet, and uh, we're going to leave it to you to tell us all about it, Alika. Good morning. Before I begin, uh, I normally uh, do this. If we can ask if the door could be open, leave the door open, call my ancestors. naivi otomotu, maui okama, puna. Tu puna kahiko, maui o kama. Ia na pua, maui o kama, na keiki o ke kai. We're back in our ancestors, back in the bones of these islands. We're back in the children of Maui to be present with you. My name is Alika Atai. But I don't come here by myself. I come here with my family to share the ike, the knowledge, knowledge of our ancestors and ancestral wisdom. We've been here before. I want to say thank you to the Soil Not Oil Committee for uh, inviting me here to, uh, to uh, address you folks. Uh, it's been uh, an honor and a humbling experience to uh, and a very hard experience to uh, leave the islands at a critical period of uh, turmoil. A lot of our people are on the Mauna, Kukia'i Mauna, representing not about culture versus science. It addresses oppression of our people. My role here as a farmer, I'm a Native Hawaiian indigenous natural farmer. And with the process of natural farming, we believe in no GMO and no chemicals. In the process of natural farming, we also believe that our process, our protocol, our procedures are even greater and higher and cleaner than organic farming. We believe that it is the most pure form that we can do to deliver food and medicine for the people. How many of you are farmers, gardeners, or growers of food? Thank you. Thank you. Raise your hand again. Thank you because you take on a sacred task, a sacred task to grow food and medicine so that people can be well and healthy, so that our children who consume this food will see a greater tomorrow in a healthy soul. It's a big task. How many of you, when you enter your field, your farm, enter your garden, or ent enter your little food plot, 
cleanse yourself spiritually. Cleanse yourself and leave all of the heva, leave all of the bad thoughts you hold. You have an argument, leave it before you enter the sacred ground. Because now you're taking on a sacred task. That is the secret and the difference. You must always add and consider the level of spirituality in the process of growing food and medicine. It is your intention of what you are intending your action to be. You want to be the best. As a farmer of food, for me, I look at multiple things, but some of the three things I look at is, I want to grow the most. I want to be abundant. I want to grow the biggest. Yeah? I want that seven pound potato. You guys got it? Okay, at least an average of four pound potatoes. You guys got it? We do it. I've had a whole two acre field, average four pounds. Embarrassed that one potato was seven pounds at a farmer's rate uh, market at two dollars a pound. I was embarrassed to charge an elderly lady $14 for one potato. And I told her, I cannot sell it to you. She said, no, I want to buy it. I cannot sell this to you. My grandmother would slap me in the head taking that kind of money for one potato. But that's the challenge as a grower. You want the biggest. And then the other part is you want the most Oh no, is what we call delicious. You want the most tastiest vegetable and fruit that you can grow. All three things. We do this through natural farming. Understanding the nutritive cycle of your plant and where your plant is in is when you apply certain natural solutions and natural amendments. Your first speaker talked about um, the fungi, beneficial fungi. We find that our beneficial fungi comes from wood. Where is there the source of wood? The forest. Who fertilizes the forest? Akua, God. So what we do in our natural farming practice, oh I forget, forgot to mention that I'm a member of Hina. HINA is the acronym standing for Hawaiian Indigenous Natural Agriculture. We're a group of Hawaiian Indigenous farmers that focus on natural farming procedures, protocols, and techniques to grow food and medicine for the people. So in our HINA practice, we go and collect indigenous microbes, IMOs from our pristine native forest. Gather from the native forest. For you farmers, natural farmers out there, try to go 100 meters higher in elevation. If you can go 300 meters higher in elevation to collect your microbes out of your forest, collect from that upper forest. Because when you bring that microbe that you collected out of the deeper forest, and you bring it down to your land and on your farm at a lower elevation, those microbes being introduced into your soil are now like King Kong. And they will pound your soil. You're talking about soil, soil vitality. How do you increase your soil vitality? It's not about farming the plant. It's about farming the soil. Soil, that's where we begin. Aina, Aina is land. And so with that, my involvement of hemp on this talk, we're getting involved. Hemp technically is not legal in Hawaii. 
Uh, we anticipate, the, the governor vetoed it, but we anticipate the legislature and the governor will approve it this next round, which will then make it legal on January 2021. That gives us 15 months to get ready. Yeah? As Hawaiians, I have a di difficult decision in the issues of our current status of our Hawaiian lands. We've been through not one generation, not two generations, not even three. We've been in more than four generations of land oppression by sugar barons and plantation owners. These so-called monocropping agrochemical farmers were terrible. Terrible farmers, terrible stewards. And along the way, they lost money, economics. So they lost their farm. So there's no longer any more monocrop sugar being produced in Hawaii. Very limited, no longer any monocrop pineapple being produced in Hawaii that were all exported. All heavy users of chemicals. All heavy users of glyphosate. Yeah. So now we got to remediate. And on our island, we have something like 40,000, 50,000 plus acres. On our island of Maui, we bring in, import over 90 to 92 percent of all the food we consume onto our island. How's that? Well, not a few couple centuries ago, we were 100 percent organic and 100% sustainable and thriving. Our goal in Maui is to go back to where we came from, go back to sustainability, go back to regenerate. I got two minutes, okay. We're going back to the future. And we want to incorporate hemp, not as a monocrop. Our focus on Maui is food food security, food production. We anticipate or calculate that we need 4,000 to 5,000 acres of strictly food to feed our people. We have an island of 155,000 and a visitor count close to 3.0 million or 3.2 million, depending on how good of a year. Every one of them got to eat. What happens if there's a tsunami or earthquake or any natural disaster? and no container ship comes, what they gonna eat? What if there's a natural disaster up here, California or the West Coast, and no container ship leave the West Coast for Hawaii? We're on our own. So we now have a different push of addressing food security, but while growing food, I, I, like your first speaker, I, I fully agree, and we have a concept of food diversity, uh, planting food forest with our planting of our food trees in re, re, uh, in just um, creating the carbon sequestration and also addressing the water sourcing for our island because we get all of our drinkable water on the island through water aquifer. So there's really critical correlation between planting of trees and water production. Okay. Creating these food forests, creating the alley crops, utilizing the hedgerows for windbreaks, we now see a plan to convert these former sugar lands to food producing lands, as well as <laughs> hemp producing lands, which will then be converted to either medicine or uh, construction material. Thank you, I got the signal. Our next speaker is Jorgen Hempel from Switzerland, and he has been a hemp builder for many, many, hemp housing is his forte, and he's going to come and tell us all about it. The first thing I want to do is a European act 
when somebody has spoken with oh when somebody has spoken with so much passion and sincerity we call him maestro and i want to I'll tell you a little story first. It happened about uh, six, seven months ago. I was sitting in my house in uh, Switzerland together with my young partner, who is a civil engineer, very clever young man. And we were looking at the TV, and we saw California burning. And we looked at each other in the eyes, stood up, and we said to each other, let's go there. And now, six months later, we are in Hopland, south of here, or north of here, north of here and uh, we are building our first hemp house. I am, I'm going, I'm, yeah, we try to be as dynamic as Americans. That's very difficult, but we try anyway. So we are there already and the house is up and soon we will be uh, putting up the walls with hemp and lime. Uh, you will see here, this is our organization and now I have to learn how to do this. This is our organization. We are in, uh, we are in uh, various countries in Europe and uh, I'm sorry, the American flag is missing, but next time it's going to be there. Uh, let me see. How do you uh, do this? Yeah. Oh, here we are. We we uh, start with an old concept. Uh, we heard a little while ago uh, going back to nature, and uh, I was starting my 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 career in the house building by um, by. Uh, 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 going back to, to, to nature in the sense that we were using, we started using, renovating old houses, castles, and, uh, and uh, mansions in Europe by putting in cement, fibers, and all the things you, you, you use in uh, modern building materials, and it didn't work. The, 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 the materials were not compatible, and they sort of uh, separated because they didn't like each other. And you just, just, you just go and look at a house which has been, an old house which has been coated with cement, and after six months the cement comes off because the old house says, go away. We don't want you. And uh, we started off by that, and uh, later on, when we started getting, how we got to started getting into the climate situation, the thing which is now concerning all of us, we said, we got to change our mission, we have to change our objectives, and we are no longer a building company making houses. We have to work now to make a better nature, and we have to work for the health of the people who live in houses. And let me just go back to, but this, I'm, I've, we don't have time to go into details, but when I started studying all this, I said to myself, Let's have a macro look at what is really going on. We human beings have been living for so many thousand years, and we have traditions, and the traditions which are closest to us are all the food and beverage that we, which is our uh, intake of things that make us live. The second one is our clothing, and the third one is our habitat. When man turns, his, his, uh, turns away from the use of these natural gifts which God has given us and start using other things, we are, on the we are on the wrong road. And if you go back and analyze it, you will see how we have been doing all these mistakes since the Industrial Revolution, the last Industrial Revolution started, and which is the one where people, instead of going for quality, went in for mass production to make more money, to make it quicker, to make it bad. So we changed our uh, mission and our vision on 
what we were going to do, and what we did was this. We um, took, of course, first of all, the hemp. Why hemp? Uh, many years ago, and we have been doing this for 25 years, but some 20 years ago, 25 years ago, came a man to my house in, in France. I was living in France. And he stood in front of my door, and he had a little piece of wood in his hand, and he said, this comes from the cannabis plant, hemp. And this piece of wood has a lot of silica in it and is full of thousands of little voids. And these two things mean that when this uh, material is in action and is being used as a building material, it doesn't burn and it doesn't rot. And that means that we are now, as he said, I would quote him, this great man, he said, we are now halfway to the best ma building material in the world. And I said to him, yes, but this is what our ancestors have been using for thousands of years. And he said, yes, and that's why we pick it up. And I'm very proud that uh, the hemp was one of them. The, the ancestors didn't use that much hemp for that. They used for other things, but uh, not for the, really for building. But never mind, because the wood which we are using in the hemp is a building material, and that is what we are using, and it has these qualities. We had to make it very simple because, first of all, it was very new, and everything was a complicated new. You can wait for years and years, like uh, the, the uh, uh, electric car and many others. If you read Leonardo da Vinci, you will find out how long it took for the aeroplane to come up in the air. Uh, but we took the hemp, we had it cut, clean, and so on. There were, unfortunately, in, fortunately in France, uh, factories doing that, the processing of the hemp plant, you have to take it down, you have to cut off, cut, cut, cut it off in certain pieces, uh, three uh, cuts, and then you have to put it into a uh, processing plant and crush it and get the herds, as we call them, out, and they have to be cleaned after the fibers have been taken away. We chose another very, very important uh, material, which was used by the Romans to build Rome, by the way, lime. But there are several kinds of lime, but I'll come back to that in a minute. And then uh, we used some minerals, and I will also come back to that in a minute, because these are our developments, and then water. And we didn't want a factory. We wanted to be very, very mobile, so we built a machine which could do the mixing, and uh, when you mix the hemp and the lime and the minerals and a little bit of water, you can take the thing up, squeeze it a little bit, and it stands on its own. We can see on the last picture how we are putting this material into, uh, into the uh, roof of a house, compact it a little bit, and that's the end of it. Very, very easy to work with. Here is a machine uh, that's up in Latvia, in the Baltics. Uh, I'm spending uh, a few days together with the workers to show them how to do it. And after three days, they say, you can go home now. We know how to do it. And that was really our first training experience, which has now become a center part of our activity. Training people, giving them a new uh, profession, giving them another, another, or another reason to live a good life. Here's the roof, and uh, one again, it doesn't rot, it doesn't burn. You put it in, compact it, and that's the end of it. You don't put any membranes on it, you don't put any plastic on it, because a house has to breathe like us. Here we have a formwork system which we have developed. Uh, we have a structure because the hemp house has to be carried by a structure, and that's what we do in wood. Uh, we have built formwork, uh, a formwork system, and we lift the, when we have made the first part, the first uh, compaction, we lift the thing up. We actually count one, two, three, and we lift it, and it stands by itself. Yeah? 
Oh, yeah. So I have this. here's another one with uh, a bigger house. Here it goes up. And that's how we build a house in very little time on the roof. Here we have the inter internal linings. And these internal linings, we are using uh, hydrated lime. And I'll come back to the, this in a second there. We don't have time to go into uh, this, but I just want to show you how bad we are in the building. We take, uh, we take a lot of, we take a lot of uh, petroleum products and the and uh, minerals out of uh, the earth we built a house and uh, we want and we want to build a house uh, which is a so-called low energy consumption house we call it in europe we call it a passive house you may do the same and we go through the whole set, set of, uh, this process of making uh, materials that can go into this house which is going to be the most uh, ecological and uh, um, and healthy house and so on, which absolutely, which is absolutely not. Uh, it's supposed to consume very little energy, which is not the case. And what we have done, in fact, is that we have sent a lot of CO2 up in the in the air. And the Americans, you have calculated, the scientists here, that it will take 50 years for a very low cons energy consumption house to recuperate what was spent before. But we don't, ha we don't want to spend before. We want to, sp to spend very little energy and get very little CO2 in the air uh, uh, right now. I will jump over that one. These are houses that we're building. Here is a huge house in Switzerland. Here is a, a farm in France, a 14th century farm all built, with, is insulated with, with hemp. A house in Latvia. Uh, I have to tell a story. This is a prison in Taranto, where the, where the, the, the management of the, of the prison said that they had such a bad atmosphere within the, the, within the prison that the, the prisoners were, were ill all the time. So we went down and uh, started this, and they said to the to the management, the only condition, my only condition is that we use the prisoners for the job. And we created, with five teams of these prisoners, we created wonderful people who were so enthusiastic about it, and within one week, within one week they have learned to do the, the trick. Uh, other houses that we are building, this is a schoolroom, I've got to go through this quickly. We have been using hydrated lime not hydraulic lime. Hydrated lime is a pure lime, but it cures very slowly. And we have developed a mineral which makes a cure in two days. And what happens, why do we use hydrated lime? Because hydrated lime, once it is curing, it goes through carbonation, it takes up CO2. So we have been able to reduce in a classroom with 22 kids the CO2 con uh, content in the classroom by 35 percent for free for free it doesn't cost them more than a lining of one inch of material on the walls right so the rest i believe these are many buildings this is the last one we built in uh, in austria beautiful architecture very difficult to build but we managed to do it with him and lime I, we work with universities and so on and so forth, and uh, of course, in the end, serving manhood and nature. Thank you. Thank you, Jorgen. Maestro. maestro, indeed, maestro. And the next up is our entrepreneurial genius, Mr. John Rulak, founder of uh, Nutiva and author of many books, a local resident, a big force behind Soil Not Oil, and a good friend, John Rulak. Hi, good afternoon. Um, uh, lots of great uh, presentations so far. First off, I wanted, before we started, I wanted to uh, give a big thanks 
uh, to uh, Miguel and Hannah and all the volunteers for this. Uh, how about that? Okay, good. All the volunteers. Let's give a round of applause for this. So I'm going to talk a little about uh, hemp's potential uh, and and get into CBD and how we're 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 growing hemp in some of the ways that are maybe not as good and ways that are that are better. Uh, but first off, I wanted to maybe give a little perspective uh, as a as a longtime environmental activist for for over over 30 years. Uh, you know, 30 years ago in the in the 80s, you know, many of us since. Some of us in the room here, uh, some of my friends, uh, Ronnie, Wes, and others, we, we said, you know, if we continue destroying natural systems, things are going to get worse, and we need to, we have a short window to make things better, and we were saying that in the 90s. And now here, here in 2019, it's kind of the same message. Maybe the window is a little shorter, though, um, as, we all, as we all know. Um, so... Uh, you know, it's it's uh, very very challenging times that we're living in when we see uh, we we see the damage to natural systems, um, and and I'm I've chosen uh, to focus on on hemp uh, this past this past year more so. Um, you know, worked a lot ar around uh, GMOs and 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 uh, other other superfoods, but I decided that uh, because hemp uh, CBD, it's got a kind of this 15 minutes in the sun moment, you know, uh, uh, or uh, 15 minutes of fame. Uh, everybody seems to 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 want to be in the in the hemp CBD business. There's probably a couple thousand companies, and there's one that starts, I think, every minute now in the United States. Um, and uh, so it's kind of this magical uh, elixir that that people are chasing, and people are looking for the solution in a in a pill or a tincture to make them feel better. Um, so while we have this this moment in time. How about if we use it not just to help people be healthier uh, because of what hemp does with our endocannabinoid system, um, but also how can we use hemp to actually help uh, our planet? Um, so I'm, I'm working to kind of hack into this, this hemp CBD movement with a, a, a message of let's regenerate with hemp. Uh, and one of the reasons why uh, it's so important is agriculture, we know, is the largest contributor, one of the largest contributors to climate change. Uh, and uh, we're putting so much CO2 now into the ocean. I'm, I'm going to ask a, a, question, a couple questions here, a little quiz for you. Um, uh, one of the, the, what I consider the most important uh, species uh, for, for uh, health of the oceans is the sardine in the Pacific Ocean. So since 2007 through 2015, what do you think the percentage of reduction in sardines is since 2007 to 2015? Uh, it was 85% reduction. That's close. You're getting the 85% reduction uh, from 2007, 2014, or 15. And now, as of last year, it's a 98% reduction. It's the reason why that whales are washing up dead on our beaches. It's the reason why when, I, when I'm in Sonoma County, uh, when, I, when I walk along the beaches, I see dead seals. Um, we're literally, we live on an ocean planet, not a land planet. Um, and the reason why they're dying off is, is because the plankton is reducing in, in uh, population um, because of the acidification of oceans. So um, really, the, the only way that we're going to turn around the ocean is, is through healthy soil. That's it. The soil will save us, and if we don't take care of that, then our species, our ex this human experiment, will be uh, short-lived here. You know, the prognostics for our civilization at our current rate is very, very low. Um, the potential, though, is massive, and if we can just focus on that, um, you know, as you know, Ronnie said earlier. You know, we've made so much progress. Five years ago, people didn't even know what regenerative agriculture, nobody was talking about it. So for the first time, we have presidential candidates talking about it. Um, it's going on a massive scale. Many of us in the room and people all over the world have been focusing on it. So that's the good news. The good news is we have the potential. The bad news is the systems just are breaking rapidly, and we're seeing the fires, et cetera. Um, 
So looking at, at hemp, right now hemp is, uh, is being grown in Canada primarily for, for seed. There's very little fiber production in, in uh, Canada. It's mostly for, for hemp seed for food production. Um, a lot of the uh, fibers are grown either uh, in Europe or, or in, in, um, uh, in Asia uh, for textiles and other things. And the building materials, by the way, um, Jorgen, I met, him, I met you in Germany maybe six, seven years ago. And uh, we've stayed in touch, and so I wanted to invite him to come over here. And he's he's just finished up built. They built a hemp house, um, you know, up by Hopland, and they're building more. So uh, definitely, if you're interested in that, you can also do remodeling. So I'm I'm big fan of of uh, the, you know the hemp construction. Um, in the USA today, uh, with the farm bill passing, that was a big a big win for the whole hemp movement. Uh, there's 215,000 acres registered of hemp CBD uh, to be grown uh, this year. Um, being grown. We don't know how many of those actually got planted and how much will get harvested, but there's going to be a massive supply of, of hemp CBD. Um, people expect it to be perhaps the, uh, rival the sales of vitamins by 2025, so it's growing very rapidly. Um, so my company, Reed Botanicals, I, I, because uh, hemp, I don't know if you know this, but hemp is illegal in California and marijuana is legal. Our, my, our Nativa headquarters was raided, you know, five months ago for selling hemp seed oil, hemp seed protein, and we had a whole issue with the, with the state of California. So we've been working to change this law, and unfortunately, we just lost in uh, in the California um, uh, Sacramento a couple couple weeks ago. But ironically. Uh, the person who put pressure on that was Gavin Newsom because his staff wasn't educated enough. Um, I ran into Gavin Newsom five days ago with his family having ice cream in, in Ojai, and so I gave him a little, uh, a little, uh, little my my concerns about this, and was kind of in his face about it. But and and I've actually met him a few times before around regenerative agriculture, so he's actually interested in soil health. Um, and is expanding more money there, <clears throat> but he's going to start. He said uh, he's going to work on it, and he actually responded to my email, including the legislative director. So we got to get that solved here in California. Um, so that's good. So hemp is at a at a crossroads though right now. The way we grow the crop, the the reason being is is the the marijuana sector, many people from the marijuana sector have come into the CBD world and they're, they're bringing it with their legacy of, of contamination, of, of chemical runoff, using chemicals, um, and not really focusing on soil health. So the vast majority of hemp grown today is using chemical fertilizers, which is running off killing our oceans. Um, but there's this new interest around uh, more organic, more regenerative practices growing hemp. Hemp, like corn, is a heavy feeder of nitrogen. So the farms that we work with and other companies are working with uh, that are certified organic hemp farmers, instead of using chemical fertilizers, they're using cover crops. Um, like alfalfa, et cetera, to build up soil fertility. But just organic isn't enough. And there's some, some new ways to grow. Instead of just growing, let's say, a nitrogen-fixing crop and then growing hemp the next season, to actually grow a multi-species cover crop uh, first and then come in uh, and, and strip-till uh, hemp in and grow hemp with a multi-species uh, in the field, so this is kind of a new a new potential for that because hemp is a, is an annual crop, which you know it does you know cause cause issues. Uh, it's not the it's not the most ideal. Perennials are obviously we know better, but but if we are going to grow, we want to grow it in the best way. So I read an article, Hemp at the Crossroads. You're interested on our on our website um, at readbotanicals.com that's talking about. And I'm 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 using the opportunity. Uh, I'm going to be speaking uh, uh, in three days in front of about a thousand people at these. At Expo East, and I did Expo West, and I give this, you know, talk about the, you know, the, you know regenerative agriculture and what are we going to do here. So some people don't like me in the industry because I'm kind of in in their face, and some stores say, well, well, John, you're talking about chemical fertilizers, and it's kind of it, it's so it's it, there's such level of lack of transparency, it's. You, you can't, you just can't believe it. But it's hard to combat companies when they have tens of millions of dollars to tell all these great stories about responsible farming or, or practices. So I really think people are so 
obsessed with CBD right now, and they truly are because, you know, like if you get get hit, I play basketball. If you get hit, you put the CBD on, and it seems like for a lot of people they get a lot of benefit. I certainly do. A re reduction in pain, and who doesn't have pain issues, anxiety, stress? You know, it kind of sounds like America today, right? Um, so uh, there's a lot of opportunities. So while we're while people are all focusing on getting this 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 you know magic elixir or pill that people want to get imagine if we can use that as an opportunity to tell the story about regenerative agriculture because we need to increase the amount of awareness and build the market so so my goal if i'm successful in a year year and a half hemp farmers that are organic and more regenerative they're the ones that are going to be getting the premium prices and the farmers who are using the chemicals will, will not be able to get as much or even sell their crop um, because you don't necessarily need we don't need millions of acres to, for cbd we just need really uh, you know, tens of thousands of acres, I, I think uh, there's going to be a big oversupply. It's going to be interesting to see what happens. But organic is, is definitely really important. Uh, one thing to just close, um, and we'll take some, some questions here, is how many people have heard of the Center for Food Safety? So uh, they uh, have done a survey of 40 of the leading uh, hemp uh, CBD brands in the country. Asked about how they grow, grow how they process, testing and transparency. They're going to release this report on Wednesday. So uh, um, I prefer, I request people don't, don't tweet or, or Facebook about this you know, until Wednesday, but they're going to do a press release. Um, and they, ironically, two-thirds of the companies, including many of the leading companies, refuse to respond to the survey. Some of the brands that are probably in your kitchen got Ds and Fs. So they just, people, they don't really want to have people to understand how, because if you're going to take a flower and you're going to grow this and you're going to concentrate it down, a flower that's a, a, from a crop that's a bioaccumulator, I think it's important to have it organic and not only organic, but also uh, grown in a way that takes care of our, our, our oceans, uh, our soils, and our, and our biodiversity. So uh, let's, let's regenerate with hemp. Thank you. So we've left some time here for questions. Um, just fire away. Anybody's got something, raise your hand, and here we go. On the, um, on, on the, on the uh, photographs I was showing, one of the things we try to do is to work where in normal houses we work with, in modern houses today we have five, six membranes which all are indoctrinated by industry that we have to use all kind of membranes to stop this, to promote this. We have one membrane in a house. And when we know that each mem when you go from one membrane to another, you have a weak point. So we have been able to develop a house with one membrane, with, with lime on the outside and lime on the inside. And we try now to stick to that. So it's simple, so on. So we are not trying to invent anything because when, when, we, have invented, when we have been able to produce a house which has not a single, um, not an iota of of uh, chemicals in it, toxic materials in it, we have really reached the maximum. And we are now trying to protect that. So we are not trying to really enforce or anything like We can do, excuse me, the, the, the lime we use on the outside, which has to protect the house, is the same lime, the same formula as the Romans used. As all the cathedrals are done in Europe, same formula. And we know it can last for four or five hundred and I think that's not so bad. That's a very good question. Um, certified organic uh, hemp CBD products are 
maybe a, a couple percent of sales, maybe, cert, maybe farmers growing under organic conditions, but maybe not certified, maybe not certified through the process, um, maybe uh, for hemp. Uh, there's no, there's really, it's really hard to say, I'm guessing, 15%, you know, but a lot of companies use organic, but then when you ask them for their certificate, they don't have any. Um, in terms of marijuana, <coughs> um, the marijuana industry is driven by synthetic chemical fertilizers and greenhouses. Growing cannabis for medicine in greenhouses in California is stupid. Stupid. You know, this is a this is an industrial solution to make you know, you know, white male entrepreneurs a lot of money. That's why I voted against uh, you know the the proposition there. Um, I will say that there are people though who are growing it in organically in um, in uh, north of here uh, and working to, to do that. Uh, companies like Flo Cono is, is working to uh, resell some of those products, and, and but they don't have any infrastructure. That's the challenge. Because you can't, if you grow it, you can't sell it unless in the black market, unless you have the infrastructure. So they're working on that. Also, David Bronner has a, has a new company called Brother David uh, that's selling, uh, um, and he's working on a cannabis uh, certification program with organic plus regenerative uh, for for like high THC but for in the CBD world you can get organic certification and there's there's a handful of companies that have that I may will take one more one more question Thank you for the question. Uh, we've been addressing that question because <clears throat> a lot of my brothers and cousins are the ones on the black side that are questioning, like, why would I cross over until we have a plan to address it. One of the plans is to do uh, feminized seeds. We'll do feminized seeds, and a lot of the pollination is what, what dampens pollination is the, the moisture. In Hawaii, on Maui, we get a lot of rain, so that's knocks it down in the humidity. But our, our intended plans are, with the feminized seeds, we'll cull out the males, get the males and the mothers, and then we'll just do clones so that we only have uh, feminine. So, you know, um, the brothers on the other side are, are appeased with our approach, and, and the areas we've selected are kind of respectably uh, distance ourselves from them. Uh, we keep in mind our company, in fact, our, our company, my company is uh, called Maui Third Wave, and uh, we're focused on food first, and we're using hemp just as a rotator crop, uh, putting in the crop rotation, uh, and, and in between in our alley crops and alleyways, we'll be um, putting our, our crops and rotating. If we go underground, say we do a crop that's underground, then the next crop will be hemp, then the next crop will go up, then the next crop will be hemp, then the next crop will go sideways like watermelons or squash, then it'll be hemp. So we, we intend to have a, a, a planned incorporation and a cycle of uh, regenerating our soil, utilizing a hemp, but our main focus is to produce food uh, and also giving that respect uh, to our cannabis people. However, we also intend, should legalization allow marijuana to be legal, we're going to be in position to also pivot and accommodate that production. That's, that's one of these, what do you call it in Americans, these $65,000 questions. It, it depends on the soil, it depends, but it, it, it is, of course, with a four, four, we call it a four meter plant which grows up in a few months, it, the, the sequestration is enormous. 
And then we, of course, have a, what we call a life cycle assessment, which then says yes, but the lime, when it's burned, which has to be burned at 800 degrees centigrade, will also will release some. And then we go back and make the mixture where we, where we are again taking up some, some CO2. And then in the end, we put uh, the lime inside the house, which is taking up CO2, as I said, in the classroom for 22 kids. So the life cycle in the end, we probably in the very end, thanks, first of all, thanks to the hemp plant, to the cannabis, we are very close to coming to a zero point. But we have to take the whole life cycle into consideration. Otherwise, we are only talking about a part of it, and that doesn't work. OK? We've we got to go on, keep going to some other questions. But because the, the hemp houses that, that Jurgen builds keep sequestering more carbon as it, over time. Yeah, forever. forever. That, yeah, it keeps, it keeps uh, absorbing carbon. Um, For your question is, is can, can uh, people in their backyard grow, grow hemp for CBD? Um, I mean, right now, they're, they're given licenses, and, and so it's, it's more, it's not for the back, it's not designed for the backyard, the current, you know, political, you know, laws. It's for, it's for, uh, you know, more for farmer scale. Um, but, but it doesn't mean some people can't do that, but, uh, but that's where it's, it's really focused for, uh, for uh, at the farm scale. <coughs> I'd like to answer that. Um, just that um, the law, the current laws only allow industrial um, companies producing that. I think you're asking a backyard question. You, you would have to um, uh, just do, do the backyard approach. Our, our company's approach or outlook on this is that we're investing a lot in the extraction facility. We're investing a lot in asking our farmers to follow our strict Hawaiian indigenous natural farming protocol. And so we will only accept farmers and growers, even backyard farmers, that are also certified in our HINA practice of doing that so that we know and vet where our products and who our, our growers are. So we have a strict procedure and protocol of accepting the biomass and then we'll process the biomass at our own extraction facility, and we will control the distribution of the CBD oils on that aspect. Um, but um, out of respect for any backyard growers, um, if you can pass our qualifying uh, protocols and procedures of practice, then yes, there is a place. We'll take one more, thank you. One more question, and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, no questions? Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Kanapo? No, maybe that's. Is that a tell? Who's uh, Michael? What? Cardamo? That's a Spanish name for him. Cardamo? Canamo. 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 Yeah, Canamo. I think, yeah, I was, I was saying, I got the Italian mixed up with the Spanish, yeah. I actually wrote a book on all the different, like 18 of the different names from different countries around the world, but that was 1995, I got to remember that. <laughs> um, so um, just in case, for any of you who live in California, there are already a few hempcrete houses that have been built. One of them is in Sebastopol and one in Nevada City. 
So all you need to do is just put into your search engine Sebastopol Hempcrete House and Sebastopol uh, and Nevada City Hempcrete House. They're very different. The, the Hempcrete House in Sebastopol is a traditional house and the one in Nevada City is a round house, like a, a yurt. Uh, however, the, it's com they're completely, none of the hemp, Actually, the house in Sebastopol, the hemp came from Canada and Kentucky. And, the, the, and so the house that was built in Nevada City, the hemp came from, um, from Europe. And the biggest issue with hempcrete now is not that people don't want to do it, it's the availability of the hemp. Because it's been illegal for so long and a lot of states, even though federally you're able to transport hemp over state lines in some cases, cases where the states have not agreed to it being legal in their state, the, dry, the truck drivers can be busted and the crop can be lost. So we're still in the wild west, literally, of hemp being grown in this country. So um, hang in there with all of us and vote hemp and make sure that you are aware of what you're buying when you're buying hemp for CBD because John said clearly that a lot of these labels are not really telling you what's in them. And you don't want to vape that either. And there's nothing, vaping is okay, but make sure that what you're vaping is not pesticides and nasty GMO stuff. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I think availability is probably a, an important thing, and we have been through this lately. Uh, we have tried, because obviously what we want to do is to have all the materials to build houses in the United States comes from the United States. That's a normal thing. But what we have gone through the experience that we couldn't get it. There was, it was not available, and the quality was not bad, but it was not available. The lime is available in certain quanti uh, uh, qualities which are more or less okay. And uh, the mineral which we are using, which is now very important, uh, comes and will still continue for some time to come from, from Latvia, from, uh, from the Baltic countries, but that's in small quantities. Uh, we have uh, been shipping it over from Europe, uh, the lime and, and the hemp, and we found out, just for your, for, for your information, that shipping it from uh, Europe, a European port to California, to Oakland, costs less than shipping it from the south of Europe to the north of Europe. So, it, in, I mean, economically, it was not a handicap at all, and we came down to square meter prices for what we are building right now, which were very much in line with what we do in, in, in Europe. The main thing is don't go any, com no compromise on the quality uh, it, that we, you are using. And I said to you, and for maybe some uh, in the building or interest in that, it is only hydrated lime which can be used if you want to take the CO2 effect into the, into the picture. Otherwise, hydraulic lime, which is already cement, is not performing like the other. We have two kind of materials. One is a dead material, that's hydraulic lime, and hydrated lime is a living material which go on to carbonate and do all the good things for the people living in the house. That's all. Um, just to, to wrap up, I encourage people to go to votehemp.com, which uh, is a site that's been advocating that, that uh, I'm part of that's been advocating for uh, hemp. And also contact uh, Governor Gavin Newsom's office and say, please, please pass uh, Assembly Bill 228, which, which, which got stalled out last month. I'm also on the California Hemp Council, which has been lobbying for that, um, working with uh, Gavin Newsom's office. And, and I believe he's going to make the right decision to support this, but um, we just need to, uh, it, the, part of the challenge is there's a confusion around cannabis uh, high THC and how, does, how is that different. And some of the, the, basically the cannabis industry, uh, high THC industry lobbied against this and basically poisoned the, poisoned, uh, uh, the bill of uh, passing. And so now we're trying to simplify it and, and you know, the governor's office wanted some more time to review this. But uh, uh, definitely we can use some support. Contact Governor Gavin Newsom's office, votehemp.com. And uh, um, thanks again. Uh, I think we're, our conference is, do you want to say anything before we break for lunch? Thanks, Hannah.
You're doing a great job keeping us on time here. <laughs>